Greetings, welcome to lecture number 26 on basic RLC circuits. I am Beza Razavi. Today we will look at another example of undriven RL circuits. Uh, we know that undriven circuits are those that do not have an explicit input and they are only excited by some sort of initial condition. And uh, then we will uh, look at uh, driven RL circuits, meaning circuits that do have an explicit input, and we would like to find the response to such inputs. The inputs could be a step, an impulse, or any other shape or waveform that we desire. But before we go there, let's take a look at uh, what we covered last time. So last time we started looking at this uh, undriven circuit. Uh, which consists of one inductor, one resistor, and an initial condition in the inductor, a current equal to I0 going in this direction. And when we solve the circuit, we saw that uh, the current uh, starts out at minus I0, the current I out, if I am interested in this current. And uh, it exponentially approaches zero with the time constant given by the inductance over the resistance. We call this the natural response of the system because it's the response with, to an initial condition and no input. All right, so uh, then uh, we also looked at this example. This example is actually a driven RL circuit because it has a battery in it. I didn't mention that last time. And uh, we saw that we can replace this part of the circuit by a Thevenin equivalent. And then once the switch begins to conduct, we just have uh, this resistor and this inductor. And we found that uh, the uh, current, uh, which uh, we call this current I out, has this behavior, again, an exponential. And uh, the time constant is given by this inductor and the parallel combination of these two because for finding the time constant, when we took the inductor out, and replace the independent source with zero, we saw that these two appear in parallel. So that's uh, what we got for the current. Okay, and then we started looking at another example of undriven circuits, and we, we will begin to look at that today. So here's uh, our undriven circuit. So example, so we had an inductor, L1 with an initial current of I0. And then we had a switch that was closed or conducting like this. Remember that we analyzed this before and we said that if these are ideal and they don't have any resistive components in them, this current will circulate indefinitely in this loop, right? It doesn't uh, lose any energy, the system. Okay, and then uh, we had a resistor here R1, and then we allowed the switch to turn off or open at time zero. So it opens at a time zero. And now we want to analyze the circuit. We want to figure out uh, what voltages and currents we might have before time zero and after time zero. So let's just pick some parameters of interest. So here's one parameter of interest, V out. And for example, this current here, let's call that I out. Okay, so we want to study I out and V out before time zero and after time zero. All right, so uh, we uh, consider the circuit before time zero. For time zero, this which is conducting, it's a short circuit. This short circuit overwhelms this resistor, right? Because it wants to enforce a zero difference between these two points. With zero voltage across R1, we have no current through R1. So all of I out flows uh, through the switch and through the inductor. So let's draw the circuit before time zero in simplified form. So below, before time zero, the resistor R1 is out of the picture. This doesn't do anything. And here's what we have. We have I zero here. We have I out here here. Now let's suppose that this has been like this for a long time, right? It's just a circulating loop. So how much is I out? I out is equal to minus I zero, right? Because they have 
opposite directions. OK, so then let's try to sketch i out as a function of time before we write an equation for it. So before time 0, i out is equal to minus i0. Right? The circuiting, circulating loop guarantees that i out is equal to minus i0. All right, now at time equals 0, the switch stops conducting. It opens. Now what happens? All right, let's draw the circuit right after time equals 0 to see what happens. So for t greater than 0, the switch is no longer there. So now we have a resistor and an inductor. So we have an inductor and R1. And we know that this current still is I0. Why? Because the current through the inductor cannot jump provided that the circuit around the inductor is not capable of delivering an infinite voltage across the inductor. You see here that we can't have a, an infinite voltage. This circuit is similar to what we saw last time. So I0 persists from here to here for a brief amount of time. All right. So then how much is I out at time 0 plus? Well, it's equal to this value, but with a negative sign because they are pointing in different directions. So we can say that right over here, right past time 0, we still at minus I0. So we're going to write this here. I out at 0 plus is also 0. So that's the initial condition that we need to solve the circuit. OK. And then in the extreme case, when I out, when uh, uh, we go to time infinity, how much is I out? Well, we expect that at time infinity, all the energy in this inductor is lost in the form of heat in this resistor. So this current has gone to 0. So we can also say I out at infinity is 0. So uh, OK, now this should be minus I0 my mistake, minus I0, and then that's 0. So we expect that it will be like this. And our guess, of course, is that this would be an exponential going this way, right? But let's just try to find the equation for it. OK, so uh, do I have the time constant of the circuit after time 0? Sure, I have an inductor and a resistor, so the time constant is the inductor over the resistor. So I have tau is equal to L1 over R1. And now I can write my general equation, right? This is a first order system. So we can say I out of T is equal to uh, I out of infinity plus I out at a 0 plus minus i out at infinity times x of minus t over tau. All right? So that comes out to be, this is 0, so that's 0. This is 0, so we just have i out at 0 plus minus i0 x of minus t over tau. Does this take a u of t? No, because you can see that it was not 0 before time 0, right? So we cannot say u of t. We just have to say for t greater than 0. For t less than 0, it's just this. It's just minus i0, right? OK, so that is the equation for the current of the circuit as this switch uh, comes into action and turns off and reconfigures the circuit, right? We reconfigure the circuit from here to here. All right, uh, how much is V out then? Can we find V out as a function of time? Sure, so V out before time zero, when the switch is conducting, when we are here, V out is zero, right? Because this switch shorts out the R1. So V out is zero, and then what happens at time zero plus? So let's try to sketch V out as a function of time. Okay, so before time zero is zero, right? 
because this voltage is shorted out by this uh, short circuit by the switch. So now the question is what happens at time zero plus? So here there's room for confusion, so we just have to be very careful. So we have gone from this situation to this situation, and we're interested in this voltage here, right? So let's change the color of our pen quickly. So we're interested in this voltage here. V out. All right. Well, Ohm's law says that the voltage is equal to the current through the resistor times the resistor. How much is the current going through the resistor? It's I0 at time 0 plus. I0 comes down like this and then goes like this. So how much is the voltage across R1? The current through R1 times the value of R1. The problem is that the current that we have indicated, I0, is going from low potential to high potential. So when we write Ohm's law, we have to have a negative sign in there. So we have to say V out at time zero plus is equal to the current through the resistor times the resistor, but with a negative sign because the current is going from low potential to high potential. It's going this way, not this way, right? Okay, so V out starts out at zero plus, zero plus right here at minus I0 R1 and then the rest of the time is just uh, uh, I out times R1, right? So then it just goes like this towards zero. So we say V out of T is equal to I out times R1 and R1 and I out is the this equation that we have here, right? So that's R R1 so that would be equal to minus R1 I0 X of minus T over tau. Does this take U of T? Yes, because it's zero before time zero. So we're gonna multiply this by U of T. All right, so that's the output voltage of the circuit. Okay, so this is another example of an undriven RL circuit, right? Responding to an initial condition inside this inductor. We talked about uh, the electronic skin concept before as uh, it was related to robotics. We said that if, we, uh, if the robot has the ability to sense uh, pressure, then it can, when it attaches, when it uh, touches different objects, we can measure the pressure and make sure that the, the pressure is not too much or too little. But uh, the idea of electronic skin can also be applied to humans. Humans who have, for example, lost an arm, and now they have a prosthetic arm. So a prosthetic arm is in this form, a mechanical arm with uh, fingers and it can actually grab objects but doesn't have any feeling doesn't have any feeling of touch in it and so the person using this prosthetic arm cannot feel anything cannot feel pressure cannot feel sharpness of objects etc so if we could create some sort of skin that has that perception and we could convey that perception to the brain of the, pa uh, the person, then the person could actually feel objects. And this has been done successfully. So the idea is that we have some pressure sensors on, uh, attached to these fingers, for example, in the form of something similar to skin. And uh, as we touch an object, for example, you were touching a sharp object, we can measure the pressure. And then that pressure is uh, converted to an electrical uh, signal, and that electrical signal eventually uh, goes to a stimulator that is applied to the brain of the person directly. And amazingly, this has been successful in lab measurements. They have noticed that even with only a few sensors here, uh, people can uh, tell whether an object is sharp or not and many other properties. So the question is, how does this work? We have some pressure sensors here. We have to get that information 
related to pressure and then somehow bring it to the stimulator and then uh, give it to the brain. Well, uh, that is done based on sensors whose uh, resistance changes with pressure. We saw an example before, and this is the same idea. This is the resistance as a function of the weight or pressure for a given sensor. And you can see that uh, it changes quite a bit. For, for example, 20 grams of uh, weight, we have a resistance uh, very large, 100 mega ohms. And if it goes from 20 grams to 40 grams, it drops uh, from 100 mega ohms to, for example, 20 kilo ohms. So it's a dramatic change in the uh, resistance of the device, so we can easily measure that. And the measurement is uh, done as follows. You can see that we have uh, these resistors. These are representing the sensors. As we change the pressure on the sensors, the value of this resistance changes. And then we have a lot of them in principle, right? We have maybe a dozen or something, and we want to uh, measure each of these uh, sequentially and take that information out. So we have a switch here, another one, another one, another one. So when the switch turns on, we measure this resistance by means of the circuit here, and then that information goes out. Then the switch turns off, the next switch turns on, we measure the resistance of the next sensor, and that information goes out, etc. So, by measuring all of these uh, resistances sequentially and quickly, we can decide how much pressure is, uh, the, the, these fingers are sensing and then give that information to the brain. Isn't that beautiful? All right, very good. Let's go on to driven circuits now. So, we talk about uh, driven RL circuits. So, as the name implies, we have some sort of input and the circuit has to reply, respond to that input. Uh, for now, we assume that the initial conditions in the inductors, any, any inductors that we have, are zero. Okay, so which uh, type of topology should we look at first? Well, uh, uh, there are a number of them. Let's start from here. So I'm going to talk about uh, topology one. So I will take a, a resistor R1, an inductor L1 in parallel, and then I apply a current source to this combination, and that current source is a step function. So here's a current source going like this. We call this I in, and I in is equal to I1, a U of T. All right. So I have a current like this injected into the parallel combination. So I, it looks like this. Zero, then jumps to I1 and stays constant from then on. And I would like to analyze the circuit. The circuit has a bunch of voltages and currents. We want to find everything, right? Okay, so uh, which one, which parameter should we start with? Typically, when we are dealing with inductors, it's easier to start with the current, maybe the current through the inductor. It's not essential, you can always start with the voltage somewhere as well, but it's probably easier to start with, any, with the current. So let's call this current I out. And let's try to find that as a function of time. Once we have that, then everything else should follow. It shouldn't be that difficult to find the other current or the voltage across the whole thing and so on. All right, so we need to write some equations and see what happens. Uh, we don't have to write all the equations right away because I can always go back to this general principle here, right? Y infinity plus Y zero minus infinity times the exponential. We can always do that. But just to get warmed up, let's try to write the differential equation for this circuit. Okay, so uh, what we see here is the following. That 
a current of I out is flowing through L1, so I can find the voltage across L1 according to our fundamental equation. So I can say that this voltage is equal to L1 dI out over dt. Right? So because I'm interested in I out, I will resist the temptation to bring in any new parameters, any voltages, etc. So I want to express everything in terms of I out. All right, so that's the voltage across the inductor. How much is the voltage across the resistor? It's the same because they're in parallel. All right, if I have the voltage across R1, I can find the current through R1. So how much is the current through R1? This current here. So that current is given by the voltage, which is this voltage here, divided by the resistance. So L1 di out over dt over R1. Uh, in a sense, I'm using nodal equations, nodal analysis, uh, but uh, I'm doing it more by inspection, more intuitively. All right, so we got this current, we got this current, we have this current, so we write the KCL here, right? So we can say that uh, L1 over R1 di out over dt plus uh, this current, I out, So this current plus this current is equal to I in, and that's I1 U of T. All right, so we have found the uh, current equation. We need one initial condition, that is the initial condition for I out. We said that the inductor starts with a zero initial condition, and the current at zero plus will have to be the same as zero minus, because uh, we are not able to jump the current through the inductor in zero time. So, the initial condition would be I out at a zero plus has to be zero, right? This current cannot jump in zero time because we don't have infinite, an infinite voltage available anywhere. All right, great. So, we got that. And now we need to find I out as a function of time. So, we said in the past that if you have a first order system and the other side is either constant or a step, and then we can always apply this idea that the output is equal to y infinity plus y0 minus y infinity times the exponential. So then we don't really have to solve this differential equation. We can just write it out. So we say i out at a time, any time, is given by i out at time infinity. So I have to find that before I write my equation. All right, so that's a, a little tricky. Let's try to see what that is. So I'm going to change the color. So before I write this, I have to ask myself, how much is I out at time infinity? All right, so that's the quiz of the day. I will give you one minute to think about it. All right, so how much is I out at time infinity? Okay, well, uh, what we know is that at time infinity, all of the currents and voltages have become constant. They're not changing anymore. So we expect that the current through the inductor has become constant. If the current through the inductor is constant, 
then the voltage across the inductor is zero, so the inductor becomes a short circuit. If the inductor is a short circuit, how much is the current through this short circuit? Well, uh, this resistor is overwhelmed by this short circuit, right? The short circuit uh, does not allow any current to flow through R1. So any current available to this uh, combination has to flow through the inductor. And that would be this current I1 that's available by this current source. So the current through the inductor at time infinity is just equal to I1. So that's equal to I1. And now we can go ahead and write our time domain equation. So we say current at infinity plus the current at time zero minus the current at time infinity x of minus t over tau. All right, how much is tau? Well, to find tau, we set all independent sources to zero. So I have to set this guy to zero. When you set the current source to zero, it becomes an open circuit, so this is gone. And then we sit in the place of the inductor and ask how much resistance do we see? Well, we just see R1. So then tau is just the inductance over the resistance. All right, does this take U of t? Well, I out was zero before time zero, right? No current was flowing through this. So yes, we have to put a U of t here. So let me just insert a U of t here to, for, for more, uh, a more complete uh, solution. Okay, I hope that's not confusing. There's a U of t here. Okay, so that's a, a little example of an RL circuit that is driven by a step in the current domain. How do I find other quantities? For example, if I'm just in this voltage, how do I find that? V out. Well, there are different ways. One way is to say V out, this voltage happens to be the voltage across the inductor, which is L1 di out over dt. So we have to differentiate this guy with respect to time, and that will be and multiply it by L1. That will be the voltage. And again, you have to remember that uh, if you're multiplying by u of t here, then we're going to have the derivative of this times u of t plus the derivative of u of t times this, and the derivative of u of t is an impulse, but this value at a time zero has a zero value, so that impulse goes away. So again, we have to go through all of that. Or we can say v out is given by the current through R1, times R1. Do I know the current through R1? That's pretty easy, right? So I can say the current through R1 is equal to this current, which is coming in, minus that current, right? So I can say that the current that's coming in, I1 U of T minus this whole thing, right? So minus, uh, it should be like this, so minus I1 minus I1 x of minus t over tau times u of t. Okay? So, of course, this cancels that and so on. And once we have the current through R1, we multiply by R1, that gives us V out. So, it's pretty simple once we have one of the parameters as a function of time. Okay. Uh, let's go to topology number two. So maybe I'll go back to the green color and uh, we talk about topology number two. All right, so uh, when we are building RL circuits or any other circuit for that matter, we're not limited to just one topology, right? Here I have one resistor, one inductor, one current source all in parallel. Right? For capacitors, we have different combinations, series, parallel, etc. So here we can consider other topologies as well. So here's another one. So I have a voltage source, V in. I have a resistor, R1. I have an inductor, L1. And in this case, V in is also a step. So V in is V1, U of T. And again, assuming that 
L1 doesn't have an initial condition. So we would like to analyze the circuit. Again, we want to find, for example, the current that's flowing through this loop and maybe this voltage or that voltage, whichever you want, right? So those all should be easy. Okay, so again, let's start with one unknown quantity and try to find it. So again, it's probably more convenient to consider this current, let's call this I out, as the unknown quantity and solve for that. And then once we have I out, we can find everything else quickly. All right, so how much is I out at uh, times before zero? Well, before zero, this input is zero, the circuit is dead, there's no initial condition, so I out is zero. Okay, so we say for t less than zero, I out is zero. How much is I out at time zero plus? So yes, this jumped, right? It was uh, zero, but then jumped. So V in looks like this. So it jumps from 0 to V1. So the input has jumped. Uh, what happens to this current here? Can this current jump? No, because if the current through this loop wants to jump, meaning the current through the inductor wants to jump, then the voltage across the inductor has to go to infinity. But we don't have an infinite voltage available, so that cannot happen. So that means that right after time 0, the current through the inductor, which happens to be I out, is still zero. So we say I out at time zero plus is also zero. All right. Okay. Uh, how about I out at time infinity? What can we say about that? At time infinity, uh, this voltage is V1, it's like a battery, and uh, the current through this loop has reached a constant value, whatever that might be. So if the current through the inductor is constant, the voltage across the inductor is zero, and that means that the inductor acts as a short circuit. So if the inductor acts as a short circuit, uh, the current through this resistor is given by this voltage, V1, minus this voltage, zero, divided by R1, right? So we can say I out at time infinity is equal to this voltage, V1, minus this voltage, zero, divided by R1. So that's the current at time infinity. Okay, and uh, then what happens to the time constant. Do we know the time constant of the circuit? Sure, again, we set the in independent input to zero, and we sit in the place of the inductor and ask, what is the resistance that the inductor sees? And we see that if I take this out, I just see R1 in parallel with L1. So I can say that tau is just L1 over R1. Okay, so it's a first order system. The input is either constant or step, so I can readily write the equation for I out just we did like we did before, right? Like this type of equation. So we just write it like that. We say I out is equal to uh, the current at infinity, V1 over R1, plus the current at uh, 0, 0, minus the current at infinity, V1 over R1, times X of minus t over tau, does it take a step, u of t? Well, we have to see. Uh, the, uh, volt, the current before time zero was zero, right? So yes, indeed, this whole thing takes a u of t. Okay, so that is the equation for the current flowing through this loop in response to a voltage step at the input. All right, so um, how about the voltage across the inductor? That's also interesting to look at. So let's uh, try to do that. This voltage here, this voltage 
this voltage difference. So let's call that V out. How do I find V out? Well, uh, V out is just L di out over dt. So that's easy. We can take this, take the derivative of this, multiply by the inductor, inductance, and that gives us the voltage. But I just want to quickly sketch this voltage just to point out something interesting. All right? So let's try to sketch the V out as a function of time. <coughs> All right, so before time zero, the input is zero, there's no initial condition, everything is dead, so V out is zero. So V out is zero here. Now, how much is V out at time zero plus? So right after this point, how much is V out? Is it zero, is it some other amount? So we have to think about that a little bit because this is a little tricky. Okay, well, we know that at time zero plus, the current through the inductor is still zero. It cannot jump. If the current through the inductor is zero, it's like an open circuit, right? It doesn't have any current. If there's an open circuit here, meaning there's no current going this way, how much is the voltage across R1? The voltage across R1 is zero because the current through it is zero. If the voltage across R1 is zero and this voltage is V1, how much is this voltage? That's also V1. So at time zero plus, the voltage across the inductor is equal to V1. All of that voltage jumped and appeared right at the output. Because the inductor momentarily acts as an open circuit, because the current through the inductor was zero and wants to stay at zero for a little while. So what we see is that V out jumps to V1, but then what happens? Then, of course, it's going to change. How does it change? Well, we know that at time infinity, uh, this becomes a short circuit because the current through it is constant here, right? And it becomes a short circuit, then V out goes to zero. So it goes to zero like this. All right, so you see that the, current, the voltage is trickier to analyze here than the current, right? So that's a property of these circuits. All right, so that's another example of an, uh, a driven RL circuit. Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna go over one more example of uh, these circuits that are driven. So we can see that sometimes we model a step behavior by literally a step voltage. Sometimes we model it by some sort of switching action. Uh, and these are all equivalent as we have talked about them before. So let's go to another example and uh, see what we can do. Okay. So in this example, we have a circuit like this. We have a battery equal to VB. So that's a constant voltage. And then we have a resistor equal to R1. And then we have a switch, and then we have another resistor R2, and then we have an inductor L1. And for example, we're interested in this voltage, V out, and there are different quantities, right? You could have a current here, or a current here, or a voltage here, and so on. There are lots of parameters that we can find. And our assumption is that this switch turns on or closes at time zero. Okay, we'd like to see what happens. Okay, so uh, this circuit is a little more complicated than before. It's a driven circuit because there's a, an independent source VB in it. And this act of switching is sort of like applying a step, right? If you think about it, whether there's a switch here and a battery here, or whether this switch is not here, just a short circuit, and this is replaced by a step function, the results will be the same, right? But sometimes we draw it like that, sometimes we draw it like a step function. 
Okay, so uh, we want to find various parameters and the question is uh, which one should we start with if we have the option to start with something or we are told to find V out, should we find V out right away or should we find something else and then find V out? Doesn't make much difference. So let's go ahead and uh, for example again call this current I out. Okay. So I'm thinking that if I find I out first, maybe it's faster, it's easier, and then I can find V out from I out. So, and we know that the initial condition through the indexture is zero because it's not specified. All right, how do we go about doing that? Well, maybe we should uh, redraw the circuit with the switch uh, eliminated, switch replaced by a short circuit because then it's a little easier to see things. So it's a little cumbersome, but it is worth our time. So let's do that. So we have R1, VB, and then we have R2, and then we have the inductor L1, I out. Okay, and let's not even worry about V out for now. Let's just try to find I out. This is the circuit after time zero, right? So we say for T greater than zero, that's what we have. Okay, this circuit in fact looks familiar from one of the examples that we solved before, but it's okay, we'll just carry on and see. Okay, so, uh, is this circuit of first order? It is, right? There's only one inductor in there, so it's of first order. So it still satisfies our general equation, because if we write the differential equation for this, it will have a constant input, that battery. So then I can still say the output is y infinity plus y zero minus y infinity times the exponential. Okay, uh, I just need to find a few things. I out at zero plus, I out at time infinity, and the time constant of the circuit. So let's go ahead and do those. So how much is I out at zero plus? Now remember, L1 doesn't have an initial condition, so I out at zero minus is zero. That means that I out at zero plus has to be zero as well, again, because the current through the inductor cannot jump, and again, because that is necessary when we don't have an infinite voltage available. So the current through the inductor cannot jump, it still has to be zero at zero plus. All right, that's easy. How about the current at time infinity? Do I know that? So I out at time infinity. At time infinity, we are thinking that I out will be constant. We hope, right? Uh, if I out is constant, then the voltage across the inductor is zero. So that means that the inductor acts as a short circuit. So if the inductor acts as a short circuit, how much is the current through the inductor? So let's uh, do it like this. I'm going to draw the circuit just so that we can visualize things better. So I have R1, I have R2, and I have a short circuit here, right? L1 has become a short circuit because it guarantees a zero volt difference across it when the current through it is constant. Okay, so how much is this current? We are looking for this current, right? The current that flows through this wire. Well, we know that no current can flow through R2 because it, the short circuit has enforced a zero volt difference across R2. So if there's any current available to, uh, to flow through here, uh, to flow into this, uh, these two branches, it has to go through the short circuit. The current takes the path of least resistance, right? That's what we say. All right. How much is the current through R1? The current through R1 is the voltage on the right, left, Vb, minus the voltage on the right, zero, divided by R1. And that current comes in, and it has to go through here, it cannot go this way, right? So we can say that I out at time infinity is Vb, Vb minus zero over R1. Okay, so that is the current at time infinity. How much is the time constant of a circuit? We've seen this a few times, right? 
time constant of the circuit is given by the inductance that we have divided by the resistance that it would see when the independent sources are set to zero. If I set this to zero, these two go in parallel. L1 sees the parallel combination of those two. So that's just R1 in parallel with R2. So now we can go ahead and write the equation for I out. So we say I out as a function of time is equal to the final value, Vb over R1 plus the initial value minus the final value times x above uh, minus t over tau. Does it take a step? Well, i out was 0 before time 0, right? When the, when the switch was off, there was nothing here. So yes, that's take a step. Okay, so that is the uh, current that the circuit provides. All right, so if I have I out, how do I find V out? Okay, so I know that the current and the voltage of an inductor are related by LDV, LDI over DT. So I can say that V out of T is equal to L1, the derivative of this whole thing, right? Okay, so derivative of this guy, how much is that? Uh, so we have... Uh, uh, v, this is constant, and this is minus Vb over R1 times minus 1 over tau. So I have uh, Vb over R1 tau. Of course, some of this simplifies with all of that. That's okay. And then x of uh, minus t over tau u of t. The derivative of this times that plus the derivative of this times this. So plus, uh, this is Vb over R1 times 1 minus x of minus t over tau delta of t. Derivative of this times this, right? Okay, so that is the equation for V out. Now, we look at this uh, impulse and we have to see how much the weight or the area under that impulse is. That's the weight here. And we see that this is zero at time zero. So this impulse carries no weight. It has no, no area, so that goes away, right? This is zero at uh, t equals zero. So this goes away. So all we have is this. We have L1 over R1 times tau Vb x of minus t over tau and u of t. Now, a tau is L1 over that combination. So L1 cancels out and uh, uh, let's see, R1 cancels out. So we end up with, so that would be uh, 1 over R1 uh, tau, so that would be R1 in parallel with R2, Vb, x of minus t over tau, u of t. And now we can simplify this if we want to, right? This is R1, R2 over R1 plus R2, so 1 R1 cancels out, but that's the equation for the output voltage. All right, so we see that the output voltage uh, consists of an exponential, and it will look like this, right? So V out as a function of time, it's a zero before time zero, and then it jumps to some value and then exponentially decays. And this value here is a Vb times R1 in parallel with R2 divided by R1. All right, I will see you next time.